It's one thing to write a great song, it's actually a completely different thing to be a great songwriter who can write great songs over and over again. This video is a special one because we're really sharing with you what we've discovered after two decades of asking this question. What are the habits of highly effective songwriters? One of these habits I learned when I was lucky enough to be mentored by John Mayer a few years ago, and I'm really excited to share it with you because it has stuck with me ever since. Should we do this as a countdown? Sure. From seven to one? Let's do it. Let's do it. Habit number seven is listening to music and lots of it. And not actually just lots of music, but lots of different kinds of music. As artists, we're always balancing our inputs and our outputs. And really listening to music is taking in all of that material that you're eventually going to turn into the inspiration for your own work or your own output. And the reason it's so important to listen to different types of music is because it's just like food. If you only ate the two things every day, if you only ate steak and chips, that really isn't a very balanced diet. But when we consume a variety of food groups, it leads to better cooking, tastier food, and directly enables us to grow and thrive. Bruce Springsteen has talked a lot about this, how when he's in output mode, when he's making a record, he's not really consuming a lot of things, but he says, in between the records and in between the writing, I suck up books and music and movies and anything I can find. What's amazing is when you start looking at the listening habits of these highly effective songwriters, the musical palette that they're consuming, it's very broad, it's very diverse, and sometimes it's really surprising. Mm. So Dave Grohl, for example, lists Yo, Bum Rush the Show by Public Enemy as one of his top 10 favorite albums of all time. David Bowie was a huge fan of the minimalist instrumental composer Steve Reich, and particularly his album Music for 18 Musicians, which is genuinely like an incredible piece of music. Yeah, and if yeah. you ever listen to it, you just go into a trance because it's just this one long evolving piece. It's incredible. And David Bowie never lost his fascination with the world of music that was available to him. He talks about the making of his 26th and final studio album, Black Star, as being heavily influenced by the likes of Kendrick Lamar and other contemporary artists that were around him, but really weren't making the kind of music that he made. I don't see any boundaries between any of the art forms. I think they all interrelate completely. Lady Gaga loves Iron Maiden. Lana Del Rey is a huge Eminem fan. Miley Cyrus is obsessed with Radiohead. Finally, another component of this listening habit is not just listening to different types of music, listening to different eras of music. Bob Dylan said, anyone who wants to be a songwriter should listen to as much folk music as they can. Study the form and structure of stuff that has been around for a hundred years. Number six, thinking like an anthropologist, not like a critic. And this is actually the piece of advice that you were given by John Mayer directly. It is. When I was lucky enough to spend a week with John Mayer in 2008, one of the things that I heard him talking about, which struck me so much, is that he always listens to the top 10 on every day of the week, but he doesn't listen with a critical ear and he doesn't listen cynically. He listens with curiosity and he always listens with three questions in mind. The first question is, why do millions of people love of these songs. One of the things he was very transparent about is that music that ends up in the top 10, it's there not because it's had millions of dollars pumped into it. It turns out that millions of dollars and in industry support, while that might be necessary, it's not by any means sufficient. It's never going to guarantee that a song reaches that level of popularity. Literally the only thing that is going to get something past that mark is that millions and millions of people love that thing. And yes, it it might be very easy to be cynical about that, but ultimately, if we think more just like an anthropologist, the question is, why is it that millions of people love this song? The second question that he always has in his mind is, how can I use that thing in my own songs and songwriting? And this is not about imitation. It's really about thinking about the mechanics behind something. It might be, well, I think that people are responding to that bass riff. Well, okay, if people are responding to a bass riff, can I include some kind of bass riff in my song, but put it through the filters of style and aesthetics that I like? So it's not going to be an imitation, mm. but it can emulate the thing that is catchy and addictive and appealing about that song, but put it into your own style and through all your own filters. And question number three that he always has in his mind, which I genuinely believe is such an indication of a mental habit of a highly effective songwriter, is he asks, 
If I were a songwriter or producer on that track, sitting in the studio with that artist or songwriter, what would I have done differently mm. to make it something that I really like? Actually practicing that mental thought of how would I improve that thing is using the mental flexibility to say, there are things that I can do and parts of my expertise or skill that I can exercise that would make that thing even better, or at the very least more akin to my style and my aesthetic and the things that I like about songs and songwriting. So the question here is really, can we listen with more curiosity and less judgment? And in this way, it's a mindset kind of habit that we're trying to develop. Often when someone responds positively to a song, I'll say, well, why did you like that song? It's not sufficient for you as a songwriter to say, I just like the way that it makes me feel. Mm. That's the position of a listener or a consumer. As songwriters, we need to cross the threshold and say, okay, why is it that I like this thing? What specifically is it about the melody, the lyrics, the chord, the rhythm, the production? What is it specifically that I am responding emotionally to? And the answer is only sufficient if you can actually identify a specific thing that that you could actually recreate or at the very least try to recreate in your own songs. Highly effective people in the tech space often talk about pulling apart computers and knowing how it works by looking at the insides. Highly effective athletes also analyze frame by frame in slow motion the performances of great athletes in their field. We as songwriters need to develop effective habits in pulling apart these songs that we're listening to and really laying out the components on the table to see how they're constructed before we try putting them back together in new and unusual ways. That's how we learn. So thinking like an anthropologist really requires in no way that you like the thing you're pulling apart. You're really just asking, can I learn from this experience? Habit number five, stepping away. It's important to note here, the creative process is not just being hunched over your instrument or sitting at the desk, just pounding away at that line you can't solve. It's really more nuanced than that and it involves a range of activities. And some of those activities we've found time and time again are what lead the artist to the breakthrough they were looking for. Sting talks about this on his interview on the Soda Joker podcast. He says, there's something about the binary rhythm of walking around left, right, left, right, that opens up the creative channel. If I get stuck with a problem, I'll go out and walk it off. Paul Simon is also not a fan of just sitting there banging his head against the table. I think it's very calming. It's like a Zen exercise, really. The act of throwing a ball and catching a ball is so natural and calming that your mind kind of wanders. And that's really what you want to happen. You want your mind to wander, to pick up words and phrases and fool around with them and drop them. Tom Waits has talked about how he deliberately will go for long drives as part of his creative process, really embracing and understanding that it puts his brain in a completely different state of mind and creativity, and it will create connections between ideas that he simply cannot access when he's just sitting at his desk or in his studio trying to write the song. And this habit has clearly been around and effective for a lot of musicians and songwriters for a long time. In the words of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, when I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone and of good cheer, say traveling in a carriage or walking after a good meal or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. Habit number four, getting feedback. And this really requires that we share our work. And just to be clear, that doesn't mean sharing your work the week before it's scheduled to be released on Spotify. <laughs> that is not sharing your work, that is asking for support which is also very important, but it's not getting feedback. We hear great songwriters talking about this all the time. For example, John Legend in a Hollywood Reporter roundtable discussion talks about sharing his collection of songs that included the song All of Me. And the really important learning moment there is that John Legend had absolutely no idea that that song was the song. So when he shared it around his network of trusted friends and collaborators, he got feedback from them and almost unanimously all of them said that song. And it was only through that process of sharing that he got that feedback and knew which of the songs it was that he actually needed to pour his energy and attention into. That's not always something we think about either. We often think of feedback and sharing as being specific to one song. But in that case, John Legend really needed the feedback of the people around him to tell him which ones were the strongest out of a batch of songs. Because he said, we just don't have the distance. They're all our babies. We love them all. We care about them all. And so that process for him was crucial to creating the single. But we also see in here songwriters seeking and receiving feedback during the songwriting process. 
And sometimes this feels more like collaboration or co-writing than actually just writing a song and then showing it to someone. And on a Song Exploder episode, we hear Dua Lipa talking about her song Levitating, which was really constructed working with some of her longtime collaborators in the studio, bouncing ideas off each other, going round and round. And she talks about that process as being very joyful, very open, very transparent. But really in that situation, it's like real time feedback. Someone comes up with an idea, they share it, the rest of the group responds, someone takes a little bit of that idea and runs with it. So here we see the lines between collaboration, feedback and co-writing all kind of blurring. Another example of this kind of real-time feedback is another Sting example. So in interviews, he talks about his own songwriting process, which will often start in this solo mode. He'll write the song with like a little drum machine and then brings it into the band. So this is when he was working with the police mm. and he'd bring the song in. And really the deadline that he would set is if he brings a song, presents it to the band and the band can't kind of make that song work within about 30 minutes, the song is cut. We go straight into the studio and if it's not happening within half an hour, we ditch it. We're very impatient, but I think that's a good way. The pressure's always on. It has to be good very soon, very quickly. If it's not, out the window. And in this way, you can see Sting and the police really using the feedback or the studio session as a filtering process. So the question is for you, how can you develop the habit of seeking and receiving really high quality feedback? I think it's really important to understand that there are different moments in the songwriting process where getting feedback can be really, really beneficial. The first phase really is when you've just finished the song, you've just written it, it still feels really clunky and a little bit raw. That is an opportunity to show people and seek feedback, but the problem with that is it is raw and it feels very fresh and new and sometimes we're a little bit embarrassed about it. But if you can invite people in, people you trust, to get their take on it, that can be one of the best moments to introduce feedback because it could really take lots of different directions and so it's fresh, it's malleable, and it's an exciting time in the song's life. One of the problems for a lot of songwriters though is that they don't have that community of people around them. They don't have a trusted community of people who they can get feedback from. One of the things that we have done to really help people get over that sense of isolation is to create songwriting groups. So we actually run songwriting groups four times a year that anyone around the world can join. You can check the link in the show notes. We also have our Patreon community, which we specifically set up to invite other songwriters in and give them a safe space to be able to share their songs at different phases of the the writing process. So if you're interested in being part of that community, you'll also find the link below. There are other phases of the songwriting process that are really valuable moments to seek feedback as well in different kind of modes and formats. Mm. For example, if you do feel like that first phase is a little bit too raw and you want to keep polishing the song a little bit, once you've got it to a second or third version, that's a time when you can start seeking out different kinds of feedback, maybe some other musicians or producers or songwriters who don't necessarily write in the same genre or style as you that can give you a fresh perspective on the song. Again, the problem for a lot of people can be knowing who those people are. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I would absolutely recommend that you do is really actively start to identify and follow the kinds of songwriters whose music and songwriting you love and find out who the producers on that record are and taking a punt and reaching out to those producers. Now, that might not always result in a response, but there's really no rules to this. Sometimes you just kind of need to give it a go. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really important is actually going to see live music and really that's the environment in which you can physically meet people. And some of these relationships, in order to get access to people to give you that kind of feedback or work with you, you may need to pay some people. But at a certain point, that's a really important investment for you. And it's really important to hire people who have the skills and knowledge to help you take your own craft to the next level. Habit number three is collecting everything. This is really about having a system for collecting ideas as they happen and never, ever, ever having a great idea and thinking that you'll remember it later because we all know this, my friends, you won't. Grammy award-winning banjo virtuoso and one of my favorite musicians of all time, Bella Fleck, talks about this period before smartphones where he would be on tour, traveling around the world, and he would have these great song ideas, these little melodies and little you know musical moments would pop into his head. And he would have to call his house back where he was living and leave a voicemail. Uh, and just sort of sing the idea down the phone and leave the voice recording. And then he would get home from tour after being away for months and he would just sit there and he said, it just took ages. I just listened to all these beautiful little voice memos and note down which ones were, were the ones I liked. But, you know, he was so desperate to capture the idea and not let it slip. And I think that story really beautifully sums up 
this desperation we all need to have to capture every little moment and every little musical fragment that comes along because we don't know what they're going to turn into. All the various documentaries that we see with Taylor Swift, you see her with her phone constantly. And when I was reading Tiago Forte's book, Second Brain, which is all about how to store all the information and experiences that you encounter that is meaningful to you in a really systematic way, he talks about analysing Taylor Swift's information collection and how she is very systematic in how she captures every single idea that she has as it is happening. And she uses that as an archive that she can return to during the songwriting process. And there are all these cliches that have, you know, become well known around songwriters. The number of notebooks they have stacked on shelves with the dates down the spine, you know, the phone recordings, the voice memos, all of those things. The lesson there really is to take notes in a variety of different formats and just capture it however you can. And the other cliche that's become really common is this idea of the 1am idea, the idea that strikes you at the most inopportune moment or the most inappropriate moment. And Max Martin talks about this with Hit Me Baby One More Time. Max Martin is known for producing, I think now the second most amount of number one hits behind the Beatles, behind John and Paul. Hit Me Baby One More Time came to him as a little melodic idea. It was 1am. He literally had to force himself to roll over and kind of press record on the voice memo. And the way he talks about that moment of like, he, he kind of just mumbled it in there and then listened back and went, yeah, it's kind of okay. And then went to sleep. And then he talks about this idea that he had a little bit more that came from the idea because <laughs> he couldn't quite go back to sleep. So then he had to roll over again and just record a little bit more of the idea. And it seems like such an inconvenience when he tells the story, but Hit Me Baby One More Time became one of those enormous hits for Britney Spears. And it shows Max Martin really understanding that you can't let these things slip. You can't let them slide. Even if it's a little fragment, you've got to capture it whatever time of day it is. This actually connects back to the habit about getting out and going for a walk or going mm. for a drive. It's really important to understand that that's actually part of the creative process. You're not taking a break from the creative process. You're not stepping away from the creative process. You're just entering a different mode of the creative process. So mm. I definitely know for me, when I go for a vigorous walk or even a run or a jog, I know that some of my best ideas are going to happen then. So rather than resisting that, I absolutely am that slightly crazy person running around the oval, like mm. breathing heavily into my phone, singing lyric ideas, but I don't break my stride. I just do both things at the same time. Habit number two, revising your songs. And there's a famous quote credited to the country singer R.C. Bannon, but this quote has been repeated by so many different artists and you hear it pop up all the time in interviews. Great songs aren't written, they're rewritten. Really, really important things that you start to see, again, as you scour through these interviews of amazing songwriters, is that the idea of the song that just comes in a flash of inspiration and pours that onto the page, that's not actually the majority of the songwriting experience. Most people who develop craft that makes them effective over the long term have actually developed systems and processes that involve discipline and perseverance. And the concept of revising your songs and working on them is really important. Effective songwriters do not assume that the way that it came out first must be the best way that it is. And we see this in lots of different interviews with songwriters. Neil Finn, the genius behind Crowded House, champions this concept and talks about revising his own work, saying, I'll try as many times as they can possibly be improved on. Occasionally, that does mean that things get over-polished or overworked. But I actually think that most of the time, when I've gone the extra mile to refashion something or re-edit or change words, it's almost always ended up better. A really great example of this is the song Yesterday by Paul McCartney and a really common myth that is perpetuated over and over again in the media about this song is like this is the song that just fell out, the melody came to him in a dream, it just blah, there it is and there's the song. The thing that doesn't get reported so much is that it came out with the lyrics scrambled eggs, oh my darling how I love your legs and it actually took Paul McCartney a year to refine that lyric into the lyric that we know and love today. So we see this habit time and time again with effective songwriters where they're not assuming that the way it comes out first time is the best way. In fact, they're just thinking that the way it came out the first time is just the way it came out the first time. The best version of that song is waiting for them somewhere down the line and they know that they're going to have to go through changes and iterations and a process of development and refinement to get to that point. And finally, habit number one, and this is probably the most effective effective habit. It's also the one that's going to hurt the most, I think, to hear it. But one of the things we see again and again 
and again is that highly effective songwriters are writing every day. I think this one hurts because it implies getting great at songwriting, not just writing one great song or even a few great songs, but really becoming a great songwriter takes hard work. And I think that there is a pervasive cultural mythology that perpetuates this idea that we would prefer to be true, which is that great songs just come in a flash of inspiration. They just arrive, they are channeled from the muse. All you have to do is sit down and let it spill out of you. And this waiting for inspiration, it really just doesn't factor into the way a lot of effective songwriters do their work. Leonard Cohen famously said, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. A writer who waits for ideal conditions under which to work will die without putting a word on paper. And one of our favorite songwriters, Nick Cave, who is well known for his prolific output over decades of a career has said, Inspiration is a word used by people who aren't really doing anything. I go into my office every day that I'm in Brighton and work, whether I feel like it or not is irrelevant. And maybe that's another reason this is a hard habit to hear about because some days we don't feel like doing the work. Some days we just want to let ourselves off the hook and, you know, do something else. But we see this time and time again with people who continually work on their craft every day. They think of themselves almost like athletes. You know, they get up and they do the work or they get up and train regardless of whether they feel like it or not. They know it needs to be done. The barrier here for a lot of people is really two things. It's either not actually having a lot of time in a day and really thinking you're not going to accomplish much unless you have two or three hours to work on something. The second barrier I think for a lot of people is not knowing what to do with their time. Even if we have 10 minutes or 15 minutes, not knowing how to use that productively in order to make progress. So one of the things that we have created to help people is the 14 day songwriting challenge. Each of those challenges takes no more than 30 minutes to complete. And you can download that free ebook using the link in the show notes. And the other really important thing to talk about here is that you can actually achieve a lot in 10 or 15 minutes. We think that we need hours of time and space. And sometimes we do want to create good chunks of time for us to dig into our work. But the amount that you can tick off just with a little focused 10 or 15 minute period is quite amazing. And even if it's just getting a few lines down for a new song, chipping away at it every day, again, seems like one of these habits that great songwriters have because they know that it's an accumulative process, that they may not finish that song today or even tomorrow, but by the end of the week, if they've been chipping away at it a little bit at a time, they'll get there. Coming back again to Neil Finn and his approach to the daily habit of songwriting, you have a few days when things click and it seems easy all of a sudden, writing. But most days you actually have to put the hours in to get through the embarrassment of hearing your own ideas in their raw state. Oh, it's a great quote. Oh, it's a very good quote. And one of the things I love about that quote is that it's so honest and transparent about the idea that we need to become comfortable and familiar with our own mediocrity. We need to write every day and sometimes we just need to turn that tap on and let the rusty water run in order to get to the clear stuff which is actually an analogy that we heard Ed Sheeran talk about in a recent interview. One of the ideas that's so important to convey here is that we can see that highly effective songwriters are not letting perfectionism get in the way of progress. They're really focusing on the process and creating good repeatable habits over a long period of time. If you're hungry for more practical songwriting tips, make sure to go and check out this video right now. Get cracking guys, we're excited to see what you write.